This is the Etches Collection, a new paleontology museum in the Kimmeridge in Dorset. I saw about this in the TV, so I thought that, okay, let's go and see it, it's new. This is the first week that Etches Museum is opened. And, and even this first week, it has a lot of visitors. We just arrived 10 o'clock when the museum opens. It's now 11.05. And a lot of people already have been here, from foreign countries even. That's interesting. So, and I saw Steve actually with such a love and care. He cleaned the floor tile. He saw a little patch in it. He cleans it. He has such a strong feeling for this place. As his life achievement, you know. And he said to me that he had a lot of papers published and a lot more in the publication. And this is uh, Steve. So if you don't, just carry on, all right? So if we start here, um, if you're very clever, and I suppose some of you are, they probably noticed that actually they've got the text wrong because a femur is this bone here in your leg, okay? And if you look at that arrow, it's pointing to the humerus of your arm. Mm. And that's wrong, but we've, it's just that the person who did the graphics got it all wrong. So, okay. so these, all I can say is these are very large protogos. They're, they're parts of the femur, parts of the humerus, the plesiosaurs and pliosaurs. Now pliosaurs are exactly the same as a plesiosaur, and if you know a plesiosaur, it's like a Loch Ness monster with a long neck and a long tail. And the pliosaurs were the same family, but they had very short necks and very large skulls. And these things grew to about 20 odd meters, and they were the top of the food chain. So they were the, they anything and everything, all right? And we can demonstrate that when we get around the corner over there, okay? Because we find masses and masses and masses of predation. And even when you look at that, that limb bone there, you'll see it's quite well lit. You'll see some dents and holes in it. And they're punctured marks where the, something's actually grabbed hold of it and ripped it apart. But it never ate that bit. Because when these plasmals ate flesh, they also ate bone. They didn't chew their food, they just ripped it apart, like crocodiles swallowed it, and the digestion juices dissolved the bone as well, so they took anything and everything, okay? Um, we've wasted a bit of space here, but I don't know if you know what coelacanths are. Does everyone know? Oh, good. Yeah? yeah? Well, there's a, there's a lady, uh, I forget the first name, but Latimer her name was, in the 1930s, she was, because everyone thought coelacanths were extinct. Okay, and in the 1930s, there's a lady in a fish market in South Africa saw this a coelacanth for sale. She thought, oh my God, 
this is a you know this is the first one we've ever seen. So she had to get it back to the museum before because in those days refrigeration was you know no refrigeration. She got it back to the um, the museum and it, of course it hit the world press. Everyone wanted a coelacanth. And it nearly caused about their extinction then, because everyone was longlining for coelacanth to put in their museum, you know? But anyhow, they're a sort of fish that they thought was a transitional species, i.e. a fish that its limbs were developing like legs, or its fins were developing like legs or limbs, you know? And it was a, like a fish that was actually about to crawl out of the sea and go on land to carry out its next stage of life. But it never did. And if you've ever seen the films on coelacanths, they sort of, they go upside down and they use their sort of fins as limbs, but they've, they've never gone, they've never come out of the sort of water, as one might say, and they're still living in two groups uh, today. And this is just, we've just put the bones back, that's what I've got of it, of a really large ceiling cap, okay? There's one, there's just a small skull of another one, okay? But they're quite rare in the fossil record here at Kimridge, okay? Because some of the fish you see here, the reason we've got the money to actually build this is actually... We're lucky because it's staying indoors that, that, that actually it, most of the stuff is completely new to science. And when we went for funding for this, we went, approached the Natural History Museum and said, could we get a le letter of backing for this collection to be housed here? And they came back, one of the guys, and said, um, we reckon we've got the best fish collection in the world, but the material that you've got in the collection is supersedes ours by far. And that's the same now with the reptiles we've got and the pterosaur material and everything else. So this is the reason in, in that the, the importance of the collection is actually gain this money and staying here in Dorset where it should stay. You shouldn't have to go to London to see Dorset specimens. Okay, we yeah, carry on. Right. Um, you may not look, but you're looking down the throat of the shark there. Okay. So if you look around the periphery, you'll see all the sort of teeth. And the interesting thing is on the left-hand side, you can see a funny little plate with like a barbed hook on it. And if you look down the side there, there's another bigger one. And there they, they hang over the heads of the male sharks. They're there for a display or something, or, but they don't, they don't occur on the sort of females. Okay? So, and they're very rare in the fossil record because sharks, you may or may not know, their bodies are made of cartilage, and cartilage does not readily fossilize. You know, fish are made of bone, bone preserves better than cartilage. Okay? So any shark light, we normally find lots and lots of teeth because they're made of gamoid and we find the thin spines, but the body parts are really rare in the fossil record. So that's the first semi-3D skeleton hybrid shark we've got. Um, ichthyosaurs, again, and if you go to Lyme Regis, if you really wanted to find an ichthyosaur, Lyme Regis would be the best place in Britain to find one. They're two a penny. I know that they're all that common, but anyhow, they're very common. A friend of mine claimed there's three specimens in a year at once. Okay. But in the Kimmage clay, they're really rare. We find lots and lots of individual bones of ichthyosaurs. But to find something like this is really rare. And this is from a, and if you say what's in a white stone, actually, mm -hmm. it's still from the Kimmage clay. It's from a coppered limestone band. But if you go down the bay and walk for two miles, you'll see the coppered limestone band in the Kimmage clay there. And so we found a, the front quarters of an ichthyosaur, but it's, it's, it's actually really interesting because again it's completely new to science and you ask why how do I know it's completely new to science you look along its teeth they're really small and sharp okay and when you study there's no linear lines up the tooth crown so in other words it's a it's a specialist feeder and it's unlike any other other ichthyosaur we found up to date it's also got a big eye and of course so you think well it must be feeding on something special because it's the teeth are not robust enough to feed on these big heavily scaled fish okay so we think that it's feeding on squid. Now squid, during the day, go down deep, and they hide in the sort of darkness of there, and they come up at night to feed. Well, if you've got a big eye, you can actually dive down and still see, all right, so they can catch their, their prey down there where they're hiding, okay? So this is a specialist feeder, and it's got some funny looking cartilage along the top of the earth. I'm not gonna bore you too much. It's a bit of that, but... Sorry? Do you want to know the story? Yeah. That, yeah, right, that middle, you can see the middle there, I've joined. And I found that about three or four years prior to finding that. Now, what you, what you must realise is you don't see it like this. No, if you, you can imagine it. a block of limestone that high, bit, okay, bit. and then you see the cross section of those bones. You can see a line of bones, okay? So then you've got to thin the block down, which we do with hammer and chisel. We don't use those fossil hammers that, you know, we use a big hammer and some big chisels. And, 
and they're sharpened in a way, like razor sharp, you actually go into the limestone, split it, and delaminate it. And anyhow, when I cleaned it, because you couldn't see all that, when I cleaned it, a friend said, well, can find the rest of it, it must be there. I said, it's not there. I've looked, I've looked. About three or four years later, I knelt down to look at them, and I could see another line of bones on another block. So when I, I split this big block, and it was so big that I had to use like levers. In other words, it was so heavy, I couldn't lift the slabs I split off. So I had to use another chisel, lever it up, slice some pebbles in, my dear kids, this is, and then you could just kick it off your foot because it just rolls on the pebbles, and then split the next bit, because you can only, I had to get down to the bottom of it. And then when I split it off, it came out in two blocks. You couldn't see any of this, by the way. It came out in two blocks. It was so heavy, I separated it in my rucksack, it was a 100 litre rucksack, with my jumper. And when I got back home, I, after I recovered, of course, because it takes a while, seriously, I'm not joking, you know, I opened the rucksack up and found, oh no, the jumper had gone, and so the other one of the slabs. And then I realized, on the tip of the snag, there was a block missing there, and I thought, oh no, it, it, in cross section, you couldn't see the teeth, so it didn't look like a snag. So I had the day off the next day, and because I worked for myself, so that's all right. And I went back, the jumper had washed away, but right where I picked the rugs up, that slab was there, so I thought, oh great. But then I had to go through about three or four hundred weight of rubble to try and find the bit that was missing. And when I found that, I tipped it up, and I could see the tip of the snag. I thought, oh, my God, I've got it. So then it was a case of cleaning this thing, and it's beautifully preserved. You can see it's, it's virtually uncrushed. Okay, the skull's crushed down, but if you look on side view, it's not crushed down dead flat like there's one over there. Um, so it, it's really, really nice. And since then, because this fell out of the cliff, I found more of this. So I found part of the pelvis of it. So when we describe this new design, all those features will be built into that description. So it's really, so it's all cutting edge science, this is. You know, fossils, you know, kids can find new stuff, completely new designs, and you can spend 10 lifetimes here collecting this stuff and you'll find something new each time. Oh, can um, I ask a question? So it's a bad shark. Sharks are cartilage, you know. They have, uh, they don't have very strong classified bone, but they do have very strong classified teeth. Yes, they well, do. How, how, is this, is this an, an evolutionary, that something that evolved from an armoured clay or something right, like no, that? Well, how did that actually happen? Well, the teeth are actually, they're not made of cartilage teeth, they're made of gamoid. Yeah. All right, and that's yeah. an enamel, okay? Which so they're enamel, and they're enamel. Got it's, like they're it's like your teeth. It's like your teeth. Have your... they got dentin? Kind of dentin uh, as well. No, not as sharks. Okay. No. Good lad. And you. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, I know that. <laughs> yeah, these aren't dinosaurs, but you're right. <laughs> Hang on, you jump up and tell everyone. Come on. <laughs> Good. Well done. <laughs> so, get back to this. Um, you, you see these goose barnacles, they get attached to like things that float across from America, and they, they actually just hang off a bit of floating debris and just feed through the water. And they're called goose barnacles, they've got a big long fleshy pedicle. Now, they're known in the Jurassic, there's no, no doubt about that, but when I found the complete one here, I just thought, oh, it's the same as everyone else has found, you know? So 25 years later, a long came professor and said, um, can I have a look at these barnacles? And he said, well, do you realise Charles Darwin's passion was barnacles? And that particular barnacle you've got is still living today off the of Japan. He said Darwin assumed he would find its ancestor back in the Jurassic. He said he never did, and you've got it. So you've got that missing link. But also, he said, he only found one during his lifetime, he was an authority on barnacles, living out of fossil. He found one new fossil barnacle. He said, you've got five from the Kibbers clay in your collection. And we've also got the world's oldest coloured barnacle. So you see a photograph of that. So that's quite interesting. Since then, I found a 2.8 metre long, covered with millions of things, all right? So it's only a two metre long jaw. I can assure you, they probably had a four metre skull. They were big, they were huge. We, in the Natural History Museum, we see two sockets like that. And we've, we've measured some of the teeth, they're 16 inches long. And that's including the root. And the reason they're 16 inches long, in the sense they're all relative, is actually they're anchored well into the jaws. So that gives them indication that they're, they've got a 
really fierce and powerful bite, and they can re resist torsional stresses where your teeth will come out if you did too much, you know, the roots would just pull out. But these are so deeply embedded that they can actually just rip anything apart. They're very, very strong. Okay? So if we the other slide. So if we go to this, we, we're going on to the thing. Right, the age of the rocks here, just, uh, good question, 157 to 152 million years old. And the thickness of the rocks here that, from that time is 530 metres thick. And as you walk east, the beds dip so you walk through time. So we can actually collect from the whole series. And here, okay, so we've got eat or be eaten. So this fish that predominantly feed on different things. So we've got fish, like these, like these, were like um, um, tarpon. Okay, so they, in other words, they swam behind other fish and just suck them in. Not quite well with it. Fish, that makes a lot of money, stomach. Okay? These, these are big knots. They, they've got these crushing teeth. They fed on like shellfish, they like dry, dry rats, they eat all sorts of things. There's another one here that has got three rows of teeth, and this is an undescribed dentary or lower jaw of the fish, and that's rather like an angler fish that sat on the sea floor. It just, with the three rows of teeth, it just closed its jaw. Real powerful life. But all, you've got to realise that some of these are completely new, so we've not yet been described. That one there looks very similar to, is it the cat? Yeah, similar, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Similar, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> No, there's nothing in the stomach. Oh, right, no, no, we're no, good. No, but we'll see some of those things. Right, ammonite. Does everyone know what an ammonite is? What is it then? It's a mollusk. I thought that was coming. It's a squid. Squid in the shell. Yeah, yeah it's not a snail, it's a squid in the shell. And it had a hydronome, it sucked water and it jetted itself along. There are, so a squid in the shell is an excellent food source or something. And what we found, because this, is, this sea is about 200 meters deep, so anything that hits the sea floor is unaffected by currents or storms or anything like that. What I found is hundreds of these ammonites with big chunks missing. So when you put the, the ammonites together, you, you see the chunks are always in the same place. And, and it's the back of the body chamber. So the soft tissue in the, the squid is anchored to the back of the body chamber. Now, if you can actually break that attachment, you can take the whole tissue out. Mm -hmm. So somebody's perfected the techniques of doing that. And originally we thought it was fish, like these big thicker ones, but actually, I don't think that's the case now. They're not clever enough to do that, I don't think. But what we've got are cuttlefish. And if you've ever seen cuttlefish octopus, they're really good, they're very skilled sort of getting over problems. All they do is grasp them the tentacles, position them, they've got a parrot like the break the shell over and take the fish right down. Alright? Okay, so that's the first predation you see on that But the Kim is clay being, like I said before, the least interesting the British fossil collector, all of a sudden we find a complete new information from this overlooked form. Okay, so we've got, this is an ichthyosaur. You've seen it on the front cover of our brochure, but basically it's the most complete chimerogen ichthyosaur you'll see. Go to the Natural History Museum and say, can I see any of your chimerogen ichthyosaur? They've got nothing, except for one splat specimen, which is not really good. But this one, if you notice, the thing about ichthyosaur, it's got a really large head and a small body. The tail's missing, by the way. Okay. And that indicates it's a juvenile. <coughs> and then if you look under the ribs, it's just full of food. It's full of fish. And it's full of squid. And the squid have got these funny hooks on the tentacles to put this sort of prey for this meal to feed on small fish. And there's a, a bone there which is it's raised in relief, so it's a resisted compaction. Don't forget this is squashed down now. Eh? All the pressure of the overburden is just squashed this down flat. And what we do when we find these animals is we actually we turn them upside down in breath. Because when it goes down in the low, it's covered up, starts to decay. So the bit that sticks down in the mud is the best bit of prep. So we all turn it up the other way and prep it. That includes fish as well. Mm -hmm. So that's a really interesting one. You can see if you look close, it's got blood teeth. So it's feeding on quite hard scale prey. Not like that ichthyosaur we just seen over there with the extremely sharp teeth. Okay. Now we get on to the mega predators now. So ichthyosaurs are an excellent food source for bigger animals. And what we found is evidence of predation. So if you look there, there's a lower jaw of an ichthyosaur like this. One half is missing, there's a big bite marks on the back of that. This slab here is the remains of about 16 foot ichthyosaur. And if you look at all the bones, they're all broken. And the clincher here is you look at the pattern, there's a cotton on the top, third one down, there's a line across, you see 
shards of bone all held there were two that's actually just gone in the bone and shard an ankle flex of bone off of the bigger. But because it's still covered in carpet and flesh, it remained. Bearing my being precious again from the underside. Um, so we can't say with any authority what the predator was. It would only be a fossil or a crocodile. You can see the big long roots, you can see black and apple crown. Okay? And so they feel very efficient with anything like this. And Think about, you know, being 18, 20, 16 for 50, so it's no problem at all. The interesting one is this one. Have you ever seen on YouTube is me cutting this thing out? And when I find it, it looks like it's preserved, that's okay. When I prep it the other way up, it's preserved, it's meant to be But if you look across the back of the bone, they're all broken, and there's shards of bone hanging there. This has just had its head bit off. Oh, oh. And that's just gone. On the there was no more of it. When you dug it out, you expect the whole skeleton. No, it's not. And that was just the remains of it. All right, if you prove that's, I'm not telling you this, there's another composer, that's a part of the lid over the juvenile dinosaur, and you see it's got a line of three bite marks across there, and the linear lines on the two frames are actually pressed with those bite marks, and no surprise for being on the Another lid bone there were two frames of it for a fruit. And it is all very good there with two teeth. That's a crack of bone in the heart, so the two of bone teeth is just cracked in the heart. So we've got masses and masses and masses of things. And this one would be interesting, it doesn't have to do with predation, but there's a new species of crocodile there. Does anyone know where its eyes were? In the swamp. What's the question? No. No, they're not. Actually, they're in those slits there. Okay? But interesting, this one. You know, 